Today on the Weekly Roundup, we discuss Trump's emergency use authorization issued for convalescent plasma. Then, Municipality of Lucknow in the state of Uttar Pradesh, India, now distributes free ivermectin via kiosks to treat COVID-19. Beijing, meanwhile, grants 85 NCoV patent, the first such COVID-19 vaccine, in China. And finally, Pfizer and BioNTech announce COVID-19 vaccine data in Phase 1 and 2 trial. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and the Weekly Roundup starts now. Back on August 19th, we first reported on the FDA's decision to halt use of convalescent plasma for COVID-19. Then, on August 21st, we dug a bit deeper into the story. Mayo Clinic investigators were puzzled by the decision, and there is evidence that the NIH director, Francis Collins, and the NIAID director, Fauci, suggested an intervention into the FDA to at least temporarily halt the plasma EUA while they collected more data. Dr. Michael Joyner of the Mayo Clinic led their National Convalescent Plasma Project, along with 34 other institutions from 17 states. Now, this project has included 8,000 doctors, 3,000 hospitals, and 100,000 enrollees. And while there have been rumblings that the Mayo Clinic Nation program has monopolized clinical trial subjects, Dr. Joyner says that it's a false dichotomy. Apparently, the FDA was about to issue an EUA for plasma, but Collins and Fauci sought to hold off, suggesting holding on for further review of the data until there was more data supporting clear efficacy. Now, results so far from the Mayo Project are considered unreliable, as there was no control group or randomized controlled trial. And then, CNN reported that President Trump announced that the FDA would allow the EUA for convalescent plasma. The FDA, of course, has had its mandate, and it must objectively assess the data and science and then make the call. It's not the job of the NIH or even the White House or any other group to make the final decision on whether a drug or therapy is safe and effective. Now, the White House did announce, and I quote, a major therapeutic breakthrough on the China virus, and officials confirmed that the treatment was convalescent plasma. Now, this plasma is rich with antibodies that might fight the coronavirus, but evidence as to whether it works is lacking. Per MSN, former FDA Commissioner Scott Gottlieb says the treatment is probably beneficial, but that since it is available without the EUA, the change is incremental. The president has been putting extraordinary pressure on the federal government to test and approve COVID-19 treatments, especially a vaccine. His advisors think having a vaccine by election day is key to his prospects for winning. Now, Trump's plans come a day after he accused the FDA of impeding enrollments in clinical trials for political reasons. The deep state, or whoever over at the FDA, is making it very difficult for drug companies to get people in order to test the vaccines and therapeutics, according to Trump on Twitter. The patients who have gotten it were enrolled into an expanded access program run by Mayo and sponsored by the FDA. Arturo Casadevall, who is chair of molecular microbiology and immunology at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, was in favor of the emergency use authorization, saying that it would make it somewhat easier to access the treatment. Now, anonymous officials said that there were two weeks of insane fights prior to the president's announcement. Apparently, Trump convinced others to give a tentative try with the EUA, reported earlier in the day by Sunday, August 23rd. Insiders expected an announcement from FDA sometime this week. There have been weeks of discussion over whether to issue an EUA, which is a temporary approval during an emergency and requires less evidence than a full approval. Now, according to CNN, the FDA announced that an EUA has been issued for the convalescent plasma for COVID-19 treatment. According to the FDA, the known and potential benefits of the product outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. A source close to the White House Coronavirus Task Force informed CNN that the FDA had reviewed the additional data to inform its impending EUA decision. Reportedly, NIH officials had intervened and put the EUA on hold. Anand Shah, FDA's Deputy Commissioner for Medical and Scientific Affairs, said that he could not comment but suggested that the NIH was out of line. And so a fast and furious, full-throttle, gloves-off, bare-knuckle contest now unfolds as the twin tower of parties fight to control the government. 
On one hand, the incumbent party desperately seeks to remain in control, while the other furiously strategizes and mobilizes to get the current group and themselves back in power. Now, both sides, unfortunately, will be tempted to exploit the pandemic and associated health conditions as a weapon against the other in a bid for supremacy. However, in the meantime, the vast majority of the people, no matter how one views the world, may not end up the better, unfortunately. Only the history books will judge if COVID-19 triggered a unified, scientific and evidence-driven, generational and historically significant shared pursuit in the U.S. and beyond to overcome the health crisis of a generation. With approximately 3 million inhabitants, Lucknow is the largest city in the Indian state of Uttar Pradesh. Taking advantage of that state's embrace of the anti-parasitic drug ivermectin as a supporting treatment for COVID-19, Lucknow's municipal administration and health department formed a collaborative endeavor and set up 40 mobile kiosks throughout the city to freely distribute ivermectin tablets to the city's asymptomatic COVID-19 patients. With a green light from the state, local authorities seek economical and safe ways to treat this pandemic. And this coincides with a well-known Australian physician researcher calling for physicians in the country to consider using ivermectin off-label with doxycycline and zinc or the Australian triple therapy. In Bangladesh, the regimen is known as the people's medicine. Health department officials in Lucknow started handing out the medicine on Monday, August 24th. Now, Uttar Pradesh ivermectin move as trial site communicated to the global network. Uttar Pradesh state health officials recently decided against hydroxychloroquine, opting instead for ivermectin. The COVID-19 kiosks are placed around the city, such as at the airport, railway station, and bus stations, reports the Hindustan Times. K.P. Singh serves as the district magistrate there, and his involvement with local governance spans nearly three decades, according to his LinkedIn profile. With his connectivity in this community, he would be well positioned to fully grasp the conditions there. Now, the local press reports that the ivermectin will be dispensed to those individuals who exhibit COVID-19 symptoms or to those who have come in contact with infected patients. Dr. Singh serves Lucknow as the chief medical officer for the municipality. Last week, the well-respected physician issued a circular that included the instructions for the amounts based on weight, their COVID-19 status, and so on and so forth. Now, much like in Peru, where Trial Site News recently produced a documentary showcasing the ivermectin status in that country, it would appear, at least in Uttar Pradesh's luck now, that the basis for the conviction of the drug's efficacy targeting SARS-CoV-2 is the University of Monash laboratory-based cell culture study. For example, in explaining the rationale for the choice of ivermectin, Dr. Kauser Usman of King George's Medical University commented that in Australia, researchers claimed that the viral load went down 5,000 times in 48 hours with this medicine taken in combination. And in a reference to Dr. Tarek Alam, a physician at Bangladesh Medical College that TrialSight has interviewed, Dr. Usman commented that a Bangladesh scientist claimed a similar effect. Meanwhile, Dr. P.K. Gupta, a former president of the Indian Medicinal Association in Lucknow, chimed in saying that it is not a treatment for COVID-19. But yes, as a supporting medicine, its role has been identified to boost immunity. It can be taken under a doctor's guidance for proper dosage. And so, ivermectin is now widely in use as a supporting regimen throughout at least some states in India. Now, the fact that ivermectin is now widely in use as a supporting regimen throughout at least some states in India is not in question. Trial site news has chronicled its use in several hospitals and at least a few different states. The common antiparasitic drug is used in many places now as a way to treat COVID-19. Now, although over 30 clinical trials, including ivermectin, are ongoing, only two have been completed with results, including one in Egypt and one in Iraq. Thus far, there have been no takers for peer-reviewed publishing. Observational or case series studies have been completed, including the Broward Health effort. Now, although hundreds of physicians have communicated the drug's positive impact on treating COVID-19, there is not yet clinical evidence required for Western societies to openly embrace the treatment. Unfortunately, trial site news has struggled to identify registries or any evidence or real-world evidence studies centering on current ivermectin activities. Now, this is possibly due to the pandemic conditions, lack of resources, and a host of other reasons. There needs to be more intervention to contribute back to humanity. So let's take a moment to talk about real-world evidence. RWE evidence is not as simple or straightforward as randomized controlled studies are. 
Why? Because RWE pursuit in many cases stumbles due to the complexities and multiplicities involved, such as health system stakeholders, involved real-world measures, plus methodical methods. Hence, what is needed, hopefully by the health authorities in luck now, is a commitment and focus to align stakeholders and the real-world measures for the use of ivermectin targeting COVID-19 patients or those that have come into contact with such patients. Moreover, the team there would need to identify the design type, whether it be the retrospective electronic health record analysis, medical chart analysis, prospective observational registries, or other approaches. Trial site refers to an example authored by David Thompson with contract research organization Sineos Health and his Which Real World Research Design is Best. Although growing real world use showcases not only the growing use of ivermectin in a bid to manage the COVID-19 pandemic conditions in low to middle income countries such as Peru, Bolivia, Brazil, Dominican Republic, Bangladesh, India, and others, trial site news calls out attention to the need for at least RWE. Although not as strong from evidentiary perspective, it nonetheless raises the seriousness of the matter in relation to Western discussions in medical and healthcare professional circles. The quest for demonstrable evidence must be a high priority now. Cancino Biologics was granted the first patent approval from the Chinese government in Beijing for its COVID-19 vaccine called 85NCoV, reported state media sources. The very first COVID-19 vaccine patent granted, the China National Intellectual Property Administration reported the patent was issued August 11th of this year. Initially conceived by Chinese nationals while working overseas in Canada, a combination of science, politics, and business execution challenges may dilute the strength of this latest milestone. Now, there is good news and bad news here. Overall, this vaccine called 85NCoV was actually in the lead among all competitors, but has since run into some challenges. Although they have reported progress as well, Trial Site News reported an ongoing challenge with Canada. The company, Cancino Biologics, inked a national deal with Canada, an absolute huge deal for them, offering them a rare opportunity for a Chinese-based firm to supply wealthy Western society with a mission-critical health product. But the opportunity is now squandered over the Huawei executive arrest. The latest news isn't good, showcasing the higher risk associated with conducting business in China. Now, in China, the military has had access to the vaccine for a year in lieu of phase three clinical trials there. Trial site news will monitor and interview contacts there to determine the efficacy of that effort. Now, on another hand, Saudi Arabia has agreed to move forward to commence phase three clinical trials using the Cancino Biologics vaccine in the kingdom. As reported in Reuters recently, the company is also in talks with Russia, Brazil, and Chile to launch more phase three clinical trials. But of course, it faces fierce competition from the Chinese players. So, Cancino Biologics did see a rise in stock price, roughly about 14% in Hong Kong and 6% as of midday in Shanghai. And of course, we'll keep you posted on the story as it continues to develop. So back on August 12th, Pfizer and the German firm BioNTech announced interim results from a combined phase one and two trial of their COVID-19 candidate, the mRNA vaccine BNT162b1. As reported in the Indian Express, the vaccine induces a robust immune response in healthy subjects aged 18 to 55. BNT162b1 elicits an immune response by mimicking the mRNA molecule used by the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 to build its infectious proteins. Now, such vaccines are generally considered safe. Some participants had mild to moderate side effects such as fatigue, headache, or fever. They found that the robust response was substantially increased with higher doses and with a second follow-up dose. SARS-CoV-2 antibodies were present in patients 21 days per single vaccination, with a substantial increase in antibodies seven days after a second dosage. Neutralizing antibodies were 1.9 to 4.6 times higher than in recovering COVID-19 patients who did not get the vaccine. Now, while the data is promising, the researchers think phase three trials are needed to determine efficacy. The study was peer-reviewed and published in Nature. It included 45 healthy adults and a placebo-controlled double-blind protocol.
Now, US News and World Report also took a look and reported on the Pfizer vaccine story back on August 12th as well. They noted that the mRNA technology is cutting edge and that the journal Nature study is promising. They commented that the trial was led by Dr. Judith Absalana Pfizer. Dr. Amesh, infectious disease expert and senior John Hopkins scholar, said that the study provides more evidence of mRNA candidate COVID vaccines actually inducing neutralizing antibodies after two doses. This suggests that they can spark a potent immune response in people. What remains to be seen is what these antibodies translate to when a vaccinated individual is faced with a wild virus. And until we see phase three clinical data, it is still an extrapolation to understand how effective these vaccines will be in the real world. Now, Pfizer and BioNTech's press release noted that the publication of peer-reviewed data from our mRNA-based vaccine development program against SARS-CoV-2 in a world-renowned publication like Nature provides further validation of our rapid progress towards developing a safe and effective potential vaccine to help address this current pandemic. We are encouraged by the overall advancement of the program and look forward to generating additional data from our ongoing studies. Now, Dr. Sahin, CEO and co-founder of BioNTech, also noted that since our inception, we have been deeply grounded in science, which makes sharing our data in a peer-reviewed publication like Nature an even more important milestone. The scientific rigor of our approach is fundamental during the current pandemic. The upcoming phase two and three trial is an event-driven trial that is planned to enroll up to 30,000 participants between 18 and 85 years of age. Now, the European Commission's Horizon offers a handy primer on mRNA vaccines. First, these are new. If one was approved for COVID-19, it would be the first of its type. While traditional vaccines train the body to recognize viral protein, which is introduced in vaccination, the mRNA vaccines, in contrast, trick the body into producing some of the viral proteins itself. The mRNA is basically like a preform of a protein, and it sequence encodes what the protein is basically made of later on. To make an mRNA vaccine, researchers create a synthetic version of the mRNA that the virus uses to build its infectious proteins. This mRNA is delivered into the human body, whose cells read it as instructions to build that viral protein and therefore create some of the virus's molecules themselves. These proteins are solitary, so they do not assemble to form a virus. The immune system then detects these viral proteins and starts to produce a defensive response to them. They could be more potent and straightforward to produce than traditional vaccines. Now, it is unknown whether there are any downsides to mRNA. Horizon noted that most of what we know about mRNA vaccines comes from work on cancer. Now, as an example, tumor mRNA has been used to assist patients' immune systems to respond to the proteins from their specific tumor. This works because every tumor is different, so the intervention is targeted. Next, they discuss the unknowns. Now, it is unknown whether these vaccines will really be able to mount a sufficiently protective immune response in humans. Also, how long any immunity would last and whether the right protein had been chosen are unknown. mRNA shines when it comes to manufacturing. It might take a few months to produce large amounts of vaccine versus one to two years for a traditional technology. The Independent offered some caution about mRNA tech in a May article about Moderna, noting that this is completely new and revolutionary to say the least. They go on to note that mRNA uses a sequence of genetic RNA material produced in a lab when injected into your body must invade your cells and hijack them to fight the virus. In this case, Moderna's mRNA 1273 is programmed to make your cells produce the coronavirus infamous spike protein that gives the virus its crown-like appearance for which it is named. The vaccine acts almost like an RNA virus, except that it hijacks your cells to produce the parts of the virus, like the spiked protein, rather than the whole virus. And some of the mRNA vaccines are self-amplifying in that they can force the cell to replicate more copies of it, opining that it might be hard to convince conspiracy theorists and anti-vaxxers that this is not a man-made virus. They go on to state that public acceptance of this new paradigm is not something to be easily dismissed nor take for granted. There are unique unique and unknown risks to messenger RNA vaccines, including the possibility that they generate strong type 1 interferon responses that could lead to inflammation and autoimmune conditions. And that, my friends, brings this episode to a close. As always, thank you for being with us here today. I can't wait to see you all again next time. From Trial Site News, I'm Adrian, and this has been the Weekly Roundup.